Uh, next, we have Brian Rotinger, who's a super talented graphic designer, <laughs> hailing from Los Angeles. He's worked for a wide variety of clients in the music business, from Jay-Z, Kesha, Lady Gaga, Duran Duran, and Marilyn Manson, to name just a few. He's received three Grammy nominations for his album packaging. Um, he's also created album artwork and campaigns for Mark Ronson's Uptown Funk, Childish Gambino's Because the Internet and Awaken My Love, and most recently, Kesha's Rainbow and Jay-Z's 444. All super cool. Um, welcome, Brian. Um, first, thank you to everyone from the Type Directors Club for having me, and especially Doug and Carol for having patience with my often delayed forms of email response. I know I uh, can be quite bad at that. Um, and second, thank you everyone for being here. Um, you could be anywhere, but you're here with me now, so I appreciate that. If you get that reference. Maybe you do. Um, before I, I'm going to move around a little bit, so this might get a little chunky. Before I really dive into um, showing you a handful of projects I want to just start a little bit with just giving you a little bit of a background um, about myself. Before I was interested in design and before I even became a designer, I spent a lot of my time sort of playing in bands and playing music and making music with friends. And ideally, that sort of became my, my gateway drug, in a way, into design, it sort of introduced me um, to design. Everything I sort of learned about aesthetics um, my introduction to type, looking at type, was all through uh, listening to music. Um, everything about sort of architect, not everything, but it start, I started to look at other things um, besides music. So um, stuff like this as well, the Hacienda. Um, things about style, architecture, um, experience, um, how you can experience music, not just for, through sound. Um, also, the music I was listening to at this time sort of would eventually shape who I became and, and what I would become and how I would um, want to have a, a, a practice or want to be a designer. Um, I started a record label releasing only vinyl. And this is really before I knew much. Oh, oh sorry, this is animated. God. Sorry, this was meant to be still. This was really... Um, some of the early releases before I kind of knew much of anything about uh, design. And, and with putting a record out, it was always the last step in getting a, a record out was, what's it going to look like and how are we going to make it, um, especially with, with little to no money. So I really uh, began to think about sort of off-the-shelf material and resources on how, how to make records with, um, you know, by other means without just sending a file to a printer. Um, but I won't embarrass myself too much with these old ones. <laughs> uh, but these were just a few. So jumping forward to today, um, I'm currently a partner in a studio called WPNA with uh, Willow Perron. And this is our office in Los Angeles where that little green dot is. Um, the majority of our work does revolve around music, from, pan from campaigns to creative direction, um, art direction, which are such loaded sort of categories, I know, loaded sort of titles. But it's, it really could be everything from a social media post to the design of a tour to the set list uh, that the artist is going to perform to the album packaging to who should direct the music video. It, it really encompasses everything. And that's really a new role at, for a designer. Um, it used to just be um, a graphic designer would be doing graphic design, and every one of those positions would be held by someone else. And nowadays, it's streamlined into one or two people to create a sort of cohesive visual language. And that's really only come about maybe in the last five years or so. Um, so. So before we, again, jump into some sort of more music stuff, I want to start with um, a, an actual self-initiated um, project. Um, 
I've always been curious and really interested in these microcosms of design and subcultures in, in Los Angeles. It has such a, a rich history of design that it is really unknown to the outside. Um, and so the first wave of, of punk in, in Los Angeles was um, very much one of those. Um, this was a book um, sort of showcasing this magazine um, called Slash from which was a magazine from LA, obviously, from 1977 to 1980. Um, in those years, they published uh, 29 print issues. Um, this is some of the covers. Um, it was founded by three, by four, two couples, um, Steve Samioff and Melanie Nissen. He was a, a designer and artist, and Melanie was a photographer. Claude, kickboy face Bessie, um, who was one of the ones who maybe had the most experience in making uh, a magazine from his sort of early days of uh, reggae magazines, um, sort of was in some ways the mouthpiece um, of, of the first wave and of the magazine. So in its, in its sort of brief three year period, um, it really sort of challenged the music industry and sort of established this um, voice uh, in the editorial um, and, and, and from the very first issue sort of staking a position uh, against disco, Elvis, concept albums and, and declaring, um, you know, it's about time we squeezed the pus out and sent the filthy rich old farts of rock and roll to retirement homes. <laughs> so it's, it, you could sense it was a, a, a bit juvenile, but it was, um, it was, what punk was then, I guess. Um, these are some of the other covers. Um, so, um, The book was comprised primarily of facsimiles of spreads, but also of unpublished photos and reproductions of photos that were in the ma original um, magazine. I was able to mine uh, Melanie's collection of 5,000 plus slides and negatives and contact sheets um, through that were in a storage space for like 30 years that she didn't even look at and really start to um, see how I was gonna tell, uh, tell this story. Um, this is Claude interviewing the damned. Um, you could really get a sense of his, uh, his wit and his personality here. Um, so. It's designed chronologically so literally from the first issue, May 77. Um, the, the spreads were shown here, sort of interspersed throughout um, after each cover. Um, there's new essays and sort of oral histories from those that were there and those that were sort of around. Um, I was also able to sort of mine some paste ups and um, old, old sort of stuff like this. So Steve was actually he, he was more of an artist than a designer, but he would experiment with type quite a bit. Um, when I ask, would ask him about the logo, the original logo, he had no recollection of making it. He could not remember. All he knew is that he did it once, and it was uh, with a brush, and that's, that, was, that was all. That's all he remembered. He didn't, he, he's, his memory was that as soon as they, they copied it, they, he maybe threw the original away. So. It, it had no n value to them. Um, everything they did was actually in-house uh, from you know the photography to the type. Besides getting the type set, everything was done by um, them three. And from the beginning until the end, they would always say they were just sort of making it up as they went along. Um, it was always on newsprint, usually uh, one color with black, sometimes two. Um, and it, Early on, it focused just on LA, but as as the issues sort of years went on or months went on, they were uh, would spread their rings a little bit. So, between the reproductions are signatures of photos, and how the photos worked is I would uh, from the photos I selected, I would figure out what month, what what year and month they were taken. So where I used them in the book was chronologically specific to that issue. So it really was this going down this rabbit hole, figuring out 
who was in the photo, where it was taken, what event it was. So it was, I really sort of um, became obsessed with knowing, like, that's April 12th of 1977 at the, you know, Wilton Hilton. Like, I knew every little moment. Um, and, it, and it was important to this because the style of, of what was happening at that time was changing so quickly. There were so many bands, there were so many people, and they were jumping around from band to band. The aesthetics of what people were, uh, the type, the flyers, everything sort of was moving so quickly. So if it wasn't in chronological order, it, would, it wouldn't have made any sense. This here is a, from the magazine was just showing you the two years of punk in LA, how many bands formed, who was in what band, who was also in other, like you, the sort of, it's a map of who's who. Um, this is Belinda Carlisle of the Go-Go's, sort of pre-Go-Go's when she was in the Germs. Um, that's Devo's first um, performance in Los Angeles. And this was a shoot they did in the Slash studio with Devo. Um, it's kind of great. Steve would actually sh also share some of the photo duties himself. Um, this is him photographing Joey Ramone. Um, so, more so of them sort of uh, focusing on other stuff besides, or not just punk, but they started to get into sort of new wave, reggae, and. Um, rockabilly, stuff like that. Um, the book also includes some cultural ephemera from that time. This is the Germ's first seven inch tape as long as, as well as the covers of the, this first seven inch, which Slash actually put out as a record. It was their first, first record. So it eventually became a record label, but this was sort of their stepping stone and say. So, what's so. More spreads. The death of Darby Crash from the Germs really became sort of the ending of that first wave, and and you could see when he died that became sort of this moment where people moved on and the scene completely changed into morphed into what later became sort of Southern California hardcore with Black Flag or the Circle Jerk stuff like that. So it it slash sort of dissolved. Everyone on and it. And, and, and the rest is a whole other story. There's a documentary called The Decline of Western Civilization, part one, that Penelope Spears made. And this is, if you haven't seen it, you should see it, it's great. This is the poster for that, um, which was actually designed and made before Darby had passed away. So it was kind of, uh, had held different meaning once he had died. Um, we released the book as an exhibition, uh, or the book launch with an exhibition. And how the exhibition worked is we built this structure uh, with fluorescent string, a sort of grid of string hanging, and each spread from the magazine was in one of these uh, polypropylene envelopes. So you could kind of walk around the space and look at the magazine. So nothing was on the walls. Now on to some music packaging stuff. I'm gonna start with No Age. Uh, and if anyone is not familiar with No Age, they're a Los Angeles sort of experimental, I don't know what category, but they make sort of, they play guitar and drums, so maybe it's rock, but it's kind of noisy, kind of experimental, kind of punk, kind of out there. What's different about them and myself is that with most music projects I'll show today, I'm, for the most part, hired and commissioned as a designer or as an art director or whatever to come up with ideas. With No Age, it's actually quite different. Um, they are a two-piece band, but we've been friends for so long that my role has become somewhat of a third member um, in that the design is, is of everything we make is we all, all three of us have to agree on it. Um, for it to pass. So we started early on, this is 2005, with a series of five EPs. So instead of putting out one record with one record label, we decided let's break this into five records and have five different labels put it out in five different parts of the world and it will all come out 
at the same time. So the first one on the left was the only one that had the band name on it. And we were always into this idea of, of what if the name was on the cover but was not essentially, like it, it existed in a different way. So as this girl wearing the t-shirt, that no age t-shirt eventually became maybe bigger than the band ever has been. So people would buy that shirt that had no clue who the band was. So it's kind of um, kind of funny. So this is some of the first two records. These are the first two of the five. And then here, here. Um, so I don't really ever have an idea visually for what any of their records are going to look like until we meet. Dean will usually, and Dean's one of the members, will usually send me uh, his lyrics um, shortly after the first time we meet, which is usually the first time he's actually typed them up. We, we get together, um, and much like an extension of their process of making music, we sort of riff on ideas, go back and forth, throw things around, um, and really start to develop what the record should look and feel like. And it's um, very collaborative. Um, so. This was their first album album, which was called Nouns. And for this one, I actually went on tour with them for a month, and we designed this primarily on the road. So at night, we would meet up and look at stuff, talk about stuff. During the day, we would be talking about stuff. It was like 24-7, just like, ah, oh, this, that, blah. It's kind of a, um, yeah, a hodgepodge of things. And this type eventually, or this type essentially came from these stickers, which if you've been to any truck stop, they have these, um, these number stickers that are usually, we'll say something on uh, the, the CB radio um, code. And we would buy them at every stop, the nice reflective foil, uh, and we'd make, make stuff with them. But what I liked about them was, was actually the bleed from the drop shadow. I liked this shape that was sort of a reminiscence of taking the sticker off, and that's um, what that eventually became. So. The, the CD actually came with a 72-page book that showcased people, places, moments, all things sort of um, that were happening within their time of, of making the record, especially in Los Angeles. So here, the recording studio, here a venue, here um, they played a show inside the LA River. So you... You had to sort of sneak down this little path to see them play in the river. This is extremely rare. The river never looks like that. Like, it's kind of, it's, if you've seen it now, it's just like dry. So it's definitely a different time. Um, certain shows. I liked this image as sort of a portrait of them, Dean on the left and Randy on the right, uh, with uh, making a portrait without actually showing them. So it's kind of, right. we made videos sort of portrait videos. Um, this was more so a lyric video with, while the song's playing, the another, a friend is drawing the pipe on his face with a Sharpie, which we did not realize would be so permanent. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're just like, yeah, Sharpie, it looks great. Like, it won't come off for a couple of days. <laughs> um, and, and this was Dean's sort of portrait. So the, the next album, which came quite a few years after Nouns, was called Everything In Between. And, whoop, there's a cover. So after the, the first, first sort of sit down meeting, um, we started to think about those moments, um, those sort of in between moments of, of from one thing to the next, and in this case, a record. And those things that sort of bookend a start and a finish or start and an end. And what happens in those moments is actually sort of more crucial and more important than, the, than what happens at the beginning and the end. And that sort of inspired the title of the record um, as well as the sort of book that it came with. It was a documentation of, of these sort of mundane things or these sort of moments um, while making that became sort of pinnacle, whether if it was... Um, being in a different city or playing a certain show or making something else during the, the time of the record. And so we wanted to sort of showcase that. Um, it wasn't so much about documenting process, but more just a 
collection of, of moments. The song titles were all broken up throughout the book to sort of emphasize that in-between moment. The next album, which was called An Object, this was, what we wanted to do was really take over the manufacturing of an album. Um, when you release an album or anything to a record label, you, the band makes the music, sends them the music, the designer designs something, sends it to them, and then you get it back in a couple months. You, they, they either screw it up, print it on the wrong paper, do you know? Make a sticker that you didn't approve. It's there's always something that just gets fucked up, and and every time through New Age, we'd always have this problem. So what we really wanted to do is truly take over the manufacturing. Um, so, and really define what what is an album, what is an object, what can an album be. Um, in this case, the band recorded it all themselves. Uh, we took care of the printing. We bought a die cutter, made the die, die cut everything in the studio, and hand assembled all of these. Um, not like 100 or 200, but a uh, thou couple thousand, 10,000. So not sure what we were thinking. Um, but in the end, we, instead of sending the record label music and design files, we sent them the finished album in these boxes. So um, we really took over everything. We essentially did their job. Um, I'm not sure if it was a good idea. And it wasn't because we were control freaks. I think we just wanted for ourselves to really make an album without making an album. So it was really about making this object, this thing. And, and the music was essentially just a byproduct of it. And that really influenced the way they thought about the music as well. This was one of the only times we really figured out the design and what we wanted to do before any music was even made. So, Their latest release, Snares Like a Haircut, which is a couple months old. Um, for this, we really didn't want the album to feel like there was a front or a back. There's always this sort of um, play on the front and the back. I kind of just felt like maybe the front looks like a back and the back looks like a front, or you don't really know. And with Drag City, the record label that released this, they do not subscribe to any streaming services. So it's purely physical. There's no digital download. So we didn't have to worry about the shrinkage of seeing an album cover two inches, one inch, which is, as you know, a, a, always a big hurdle in today's sort of album packaging space. So this circle with the song titles became sort of the, the typographic sort of trope throughout. On the cover, the price of each format is printed. Um, and then on the back, the phone number for the record label exists. So if you call the record label, they're supposed to send you a free shirt. So the hopes was that, and my hope was that a bunch of people would just call it and not know what it was. Um, here's the center labels. And in, in typical no age fashion, we always have some sort of snarky comment. So digital download not included on a CD. It's kind of, <laughs> as if, if you know with physical releases, um, there's always a sticker that says digital download included and it's always like a reason to buy the physical. Um, but we made this one. Um, so Jay-Z's Magna Carta Holy Grail was maybe the first real commercial, large, extensive album campaign that I, I was involved in. Prior to this, I was doing sort of mid-level indie bands um, or somewhat larger indie bands. And this was the, the first time where I had got to experience sort of something that was going to be uh, on CNN or in Times Square, like, the day after I'd finish it. So it was a definitely a, a change the way I thought about things. Uh, it, was, it was a record that uh, we really had lots of conversations about what the album could be or what the album meant to him conceptually and how it was this duality of 
how you navigate your way through life, through success, failures, um, all these sort of things, and how do you stay true to yourself? Um, you know, at, for Jay Z as a rapper, a father, a businessman, uh, all these different sort of titles, like how do how do you navigate that? And so, at that moment, we really realize like how can it be this thing that's both masculine and feminine, this sort of this push and this pull, and that that really controlled the sort of image that we wanted to have. Um, the type, which all was became this sort of visual language of redacting information. At the time, sort of WikiLeaks and uh, government information, uh, what we don't know, what we should know, what's important, it was, it was all being kept and some, was, some of it was revealed to us and it, was, it really became a sort of moment for us to uh, use the lyrics as um, a way to reveal certain moments of the song, to unreveal moments, and so the packaging came with two books. There's a Magna Carta book and a Holy Grail book. And all the lyrics were redacted like this, but all the redaction was scratch off ink. So you can scratch it and reveal it. And all these pages were hidden inside folds, so you didn't even see them. You had to sort of tear the pages to get to it and then redact it. Um, so. And it was the way to reveal the track listing as well. The track listing was nowhere on the packaging unless you sort of scratch these moments. Um, so the photos were all done by Ari Markopoulos here, and they became a visual, a sort of photographic essay, a quite literal one in a sense, of each sort of track. So it told it, the story typographically, but also told the story visually, which I, I felt was quite important. I think for some of these records, you kind of have to have a, a moment that's really obvious and literal, um, it's, which I try to avoid, but in some cases it, it's, it's requ not required, but they otherwise they had no clue what, um, what I'm doing. The back of the album actually had, for the physical, actually had a hidden track inside the record. So when you looked at the release, the back like this, if you tore it open, there was a hidden postcard flexi with a hidden track. So you ripped the package out and you could play that little postcard as a record. There's a song on there. So you had to destroy this p thing that you just bought. So um, the language, type language, was really comprised of these certain elements. The redacted logo, the Magna Carta Holy Grail cross, and then the redacted and unredacted sort of title. And that sort of stretched its way out through the whole sort of campaign. So we made all sorts of stuff, an album on the USB, and it really l sort of stretched its way into merch. There was a whole line of merch. So, yeah. so. What I like about certain sort of records is what comes out as soon as something's released. The day after, the minute after, there's always a bootleg, there's always a meme, there's, there's always something. And I think for this one was the first time where it was really simple for someone to make an image black and white, set some type and redact it. So it, it, it was everywhere. So these are just a collection of some bootlegs, and, um, which I am obsessed, obsessed with bootlegs, so I try to collect them. I think I have more images of, for some projects of the bootlegs than of what I made. <laughs> so, um, so real quickly, I'm just gonna just power through a, uh, a few albums um, without showing you the entire campaign, um, and really just speak about the process and the making of um, what it meant for certain records. For Mark Ronson's Uptown Special, we we really were thinking about the record as a logo. What what would become this thing if we could just have some sort of like symbol um, that would just be everywhere and sort of would re represent him and work at you know the size of a little avatar, quarter of an inch or whatever. Mark would constantly send me things like the Rolling Stones logo, um, the Germs logo, uh, the super iconic things, and be like, "What about something like? Can you do something like this?" And it's, it's always it's always funny when someone sends you some of the best things in the world and is like, maybe like this? Like, 
Um, like, no, I don't want to make something good. Um, <laughs> but, but so for this, we we he was sending me microphones, turntables, speakers, just all sorts of things. So the idea was like, what if you m meld these things together and it becomes this sort of abstraction of all these sort of ideas that we were talking about, and that became this sort of thing, which I always thought would just be the Uptown Special thing and the Uptown Special logo, but now it's just become Mark. Like from now on, it's it's always he still uses it for everything. So it, I guess, what we set out to do, we sort of did. Um, some of the inside packaging, um, shot from uh, twenty five feet above. So that grid is actually in camera with string. It's not not done in digital. So it's kind of fun. For Florence, this was a um, moment where, so Florence and the Machine, I, I'd always sort of referred to Florence as just Florence. I would never say Florence and the Machine. So I had this idea of presenting to them, like, what if we don't put the full band name on the cover and we just say Florence? Um, not thinking that, the you know, it, people would know if you show an image with her and say Florence that it's still Florence and the Machine. And they actually were really excited about this this idea, and so it it really became something different than what we'd expect with just saying Florence and the Machine. So we did a week long photo shoot in in Mexico, um, thinking that we were going to find the greatest album cover. And I knew when we were shooting, it was never going to we weren't going to find it. It wasn't the right thing. It wasn't the right space for shooting a cover. And before so, we did a little test shoot in a studio with no makeup, very little lighting, not intended for use, just to sort of get a vibe, just to sort of start the conversation. And when we came back, I knew immediately, like, these are the photos we should use. We didn't have to go to Mexico. We could have just been fine. <laughs> um, we did use those Mexico photos, but the cover really uh, set of images became the test shoot images. For this version, we did a box set where each song um, from the album, How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful, became uh, a seven inch. So two songs per seven inch. And how the album worked was, uh, or how the seven inches worked on one side was a color that represented the sky, and on the opposite side was a color that represented the ocean. So at different times. So, so it was 12 different uh, custom blues. So up here, you kind of could, maybe it looks like only a few, but it's in person, they, they're all different. So. For, for some artists, it's the, the process is, N starts in different areas and it's never it's never the same and Miguel is an artist who really wanted to have he as a, as a, a performer he wanted to have a somewhat of a typographic identity he didn't want a logo per se he wanted to have his own typeface where if it said Miguel you knew it was him but if you said s any other word you'd a viewer would recognize the typeface and be like, oh, that's Miguel. So you could just do a billboard that says, coming soon. People would recognize that typeface and, and just know it's Miguel. Um, so we started, and it's I'm showing you this typeface as it's done, but it's still an evolving sort of project. But this is the current um, typeface. So these are the caps. Lowercase. So the one thing with that is when you make it and you send it and every other, you know, he has multiple people using it, they tend to butcher it. So it's, it's finding that balance where you can limit the, the, the use and the, the other sort of in-house people butchering stuff. Kesha was a, a whole opposite end of the spectrum. Um, we wanted to create a world, like r almost rebrand her as this new artist. And she, 
and by creating this world that she lived in. This was, she had gone through a lot of legal s- sort of battles and, and was just coming outside of that. And it was almost like this rebirth for her. And a, a lot of times when working with artists, they have ideas, they have references, they have certain things they want to do. But throughout that journey is really a, an, an educational process. You know, For myself, I'm constantly talking about things and showing them references to sort of get them into this sort of lane of understanding where things could go. And it's very visual. So for this particular uh, record, we, we wanted to have it feel like it could be from a different time, but also feel um, contemporary. So Robert Beattie, uh, an illustrator from Kentucky, did all these um, illustrations. So I would just draw this as a scribble by hand, right? spaceship, her in the ocean, eyeball, wave, floating skull, really crude, and then send it to him, and he would um, convert it into this. So we did actually do a photo shoot in in the ocean. So that's the only part that's not illustrated. That's a real um, image of her. So looking back, so it's it's meant to be. She's abducted and she's on this spaceship on this UFO and she's taken to this other world. So, so we really started to create this this narrative, and now it's at this moment it's translating into the live um, show. So there's some of the inside images. So if you live in New York, you probably saw this blasted everywhere. This, for Jay's last and thir- or last album, his 13th album, it was really about wanting to make an album that was entirely sort of didactic and stripped down and just personal and revealing with l- as much or as little as we could. So the entire sort of campaign really became about this lockup of the 444 and this together. So we started out with just the 444 blasting it everywhere. And in a matter of a few weeks when people figured it out, we added the the Jay-Z to it. So the entire campaign was just that, the title and these two colors which I quickly learned when you use this color in a print sort of color space, color space, it's fine, but as soon as you take this color to any RGB LED sort of out of home ad, it's like the worst. It's inconsistent as all can be because those things are never color corrected, so it's always gonna look different. So. The typeface, uh, Larish New, by Redeem Pesco, we used uh, with just a custom J and a custom colon. So it's kind of funny. I'll see all the bootlegs out there, and I could always tell by the J and the colon when, when someone didn't, uh, when it was always a bootleg. So merch, there's all merch bootlegs, all that stuff. The other um, driving visual moment was just this title. This is his 13th studio album. So from from early on, we we didn't want the album anywhere to say his name. We just wanted to say 13th Studio Album, and if you knew, you knew. And so uh, it became a, a sort of a, a really strong graphic element in the in the campaign. So so before the album was even finished, we sort of designed it as a sort of a, a branding exercise. So all the billboards were sent and delivered. Um, and so we really made a, a package, and so that got sent, and everything got uh, got made. So it was everywhere, from billboards to banners to trains to buses, um, all around, all around the world. So it became a bit uh, sort of annoying. I could understand, like people get tired of seeing it, but I think that was the point. What I loved about this was before anyone knew what it was it was all over the the news in the internet of people guessing what it was and that documentation of 
what people think and what people um, thought it was or what they were saying it was is, is great. So it creates this sort of um, buzz. This is just a selection of some. Once people knew it was, you know, Jay-Z, it was, then it was kind of stopped, but. Um, you could see on that middle one, we, we actually, which I'll show some renderings of, but we made some uh, merch as well that um, came out around the same, same time. So if you saw someone wearing it, you'd see the merch and then you'd see the billboard. You still didn't know sort of quite what it was. Um, these are some of the real ones. So the colors you could see look totally different. And then if you were here, you saw that one probably. The actual CD itself um, included little to no information, just this and photographs of the billboards <laughs> um, in different cities. So really, like, I feel like I'm showing the same image over and over. That's what it was. It was pretty much that. Um, here's some of the merch. Again, more billboards. Uh, the tour, uh, which finished in December, um, was this octagonal stage that raised and lowered um, during the show with these sort of eight massive motion tracked uh, projector screens that would sort of jut outward and at sharp angles and float above the audience and sort of move around. And the screen content was a mix of mediums from sort of traditional HD all the way to sort of crappy VHS uh, with film grain and stuff. And in each city of the tour, um, the day that, as soon as the bus got there, um, a videographer would go make a, a video about the city and, and really quickly and it would be part of the uh, projections that night. So every night had sort of exclusive content. So depending on where you saw the show, it was different. So this is it from the set down. So really became this sort of severe architectural element. Um, and he, with this sort of center piece, um, it, the, all the focus is really towards the center. Um, and it's a very sort of transparent performance in the sense that it's almost like watching a sporting event where it's center stage and the crowd is around. So. so lastly, I want to finish with similar to how I started with another sort of self-initiated um, project of diving into another LA subculture um, in the good name of the company. The Colby Poster Printing Company from Los Angeles, if, uh, if anyone knows it, was a printing company, a three union print shop from Los Angeles that started in 1948 until they closed at the end of 2012. Um, they, they would print sort of indiscriminately for anyone who walked through their door. Um, they primarily did letterpress though. And in the beginning, in many ways, they sort of paralleled the sort of evolving and multifaceted um, political dynamic um, moments of Los Angeles. Um, as a shop, as a print shop, they were hired to mostly print campaign posters and other uh, collateral materials for political campaigns because they were a union print shop. Um, but fr frequently they did most, how I was introduced to them was by uh, their music posters, which were all over the city. Um, the only t common sort of technical thread um, throughout all of them, whether if it was a political poster, a merchant poster, or a music poster, was the visual language, was the letterpress. Um, they maintained its sort of letterpress um, as a cornerstone, like up until the day they, they ended. Um, so as there's quite a few letterpress places in Los Angeles, but as they all sort of would close or one would, would move or anything, they, one would sell off its type or donate it. Um, Colby would actually um, acquire a lot of type libraries um, from other printers. So they had this massive range of type and it was sort of 
all over the place. And you kind of could get a sense of that from these posters uh, in their sort of naiveness sometimes there. Um, you could see in the performing, just that P was not a style dischoice. Um, it was purely out of laziness that the typesetter probably couldn't find that um, P for that cut. So he found one that fit. And that that happened across the board. And that eventually became what they were known for. Um, the split fountain gradients, um, which are not essentially a Colby trademark. You know, we've seen these in uh, sort of street posters like this. Um, it's a technique um, that they developed in a very idiosyncratic way. So they would, you know, for instance, a reggae poster, they would do red, white, and green. So they would tie, to, tie it together culturally um, for a particular sort of audience. Um, for here, the fluorescent sort of posters um, was kind of a watershed development for them. Uh, in many ways, uh, printed matter, you know, especially on the streets of Los Angeles where you're driving by 60, 75 miles per hour, sometimes slower, sometimes faster, you need that immediacy. And I th that was something that they really banked on, was loud colors and bold sort of type. This one's actually quite, quite dense. Um, so a lot of the concert promoters, a lot of the music posters really, really subscribe to using those uh, colors. But you can see sometimes the type is as wonky and naive as can be, and it's really uh, was, was their thing, so. This is their Heidelberg, and this is one of their type rooms, so the organized one. Um, so, you know, whether it was aesthetic or practical or, um, you know, everything designed was made by a typesetter. It wasn't a designer. Um, you know, and unless someone came in and gave a very, very specific request, such as, you know, make it big, make it small, make it centered, I like it bold, condensed, whatever, um, you wouldn't know what you were going to get. Um, you could give them compositional rules, but very now and then it would, you'd get back something different. Um, they would pre-print the fluorescent colors so you can, you know, they'd have stacks of this and you would just choose. Um, so that was always pre-printed. And that was, the fluorescent was actually screen printed. So that was the only thing on these that were screen printed. Um, yeah. So a lot of those typesetting decisions, like I said, were like a conscious effort to work quick to, quickly, practical, and, and get it done efficiently. So like I said, if a number was gone or a letter was gone, they would fill it with something else they could find. Um, so I don't really think they knew that over all these years, they were actually creating a body of work. They were had no interest in design. They were just a print shop. Um, for them, it was just purely commercial. So with their archive, they would keep, keep jobs for a year. So they'd keep one poster, sometimes two, for a year. And after that year was up and they did their taxes, they would throw them away. So after 64 years in business, you, they would have had millions of posters. They really only had a couple hundred. So, and a large part of their business, especially in Los Angeles, is this cottage industry business. So if you have a truck, you can make a poster, make some signs, and now you have a moving company. If you know how to braid or weave or cut hair, you can make a poster, now you have a salon. So it's, it's a large industry in, in Los Angeles. And these posters, in many ways, became the canvas of the city. Um, every street corner, every pole, they're everywhere. So as I grew up, I sort of grew up with these, seeing them everywhere. Um, so. A lot of the posters that would be around the city were actually quite tragic, quite a trilogy of tragedy, I would call them. It would be um, you know, rooms for rent or that are really cheap and low income, a divorce, um, um, funeral homes, like all these sort of quite sad things that would be designed quite beautifully. Um, so I have quite a, the collection of those. Uh, and as you may know, if you are familiar, the years many artists have used Colby uh, 
and use their posters as a sort of medium. Um, there's tons, um, but to me, the one that sticks out the most is Alan Rupersberg, who phonetically transcribed Ginsburg's entire um, poem, Howl, into a series of, of posters. Um, so the entire poem trans phonetically. So. Um, Callie DeWitt did a series of posters with these destructive statements uh, or social commentary, such as burn it down or cease to exist. And these would exist in the city. So for this one, this was how Callie would send it to them. So red, yellow, green, burn it down. The size 22 by 28, and it was $200 for, I don't remember how many. But. So when Colby decided to shut their doors, uh, I was lucky enough to have a, a relationship with them where they let me come in mine their archive, take their archive, and sort of celebrate it. And, and that was actually a feat, because for years and years of going there, I'd see stacks of these posters, and I'd be like, oh, can I just take one of these? Never. They'd have 500 public enemy posters. They wouldn't let me take one. And you know, I, as a designer, you're like, oh, what's one? Like, They're not going to count if there's 500. You're not, they're not going to know. And they, they were really true that if you didn't pay for it, you couldn't take one. So. When they closed and I was actually able to take these posters, it was a big moment um, where I wanted to celebrate their, their history. And so we did so with a exhibition and book called In the Good Name um, of the Company. Um, you know, here's some installation shots. Um, this is the exhibition uh, from Los Angeles. And it was up for a month uh, and then the book came out um, and it was a selection of m mostly merchant posters and, mu and music ones, but quite a lot of the, the artwork uh, that we saw before. So it was really a mix. So you couldn't, you couldn't really tell was what was what sometimes. Um, and some ephemera from the shop. Um, here, the exhibition moved to Long Island City for a couple weeks during the art book fair um, with a, the same selection of posters just organized in, in a, a, a different grid, different size, different size room. And then it moved to Lyon, France a couple years later. So. so I'm gonna end with this uh, just quick um, last scene from a documentary that we made during the making of the book. For Colby, it wasn't about art, it was about printing, getting the job right, getting the job done on budget. It wasn't right, it wasn't wrong, it was the Colby way. So I found myself here at the press on December 31st. The print was called Adios. For some reason, it seemed to fit. I spent over half a century coming into the Colby Poster Printing Company, looking for excuses to continue printing with them. I liked the process of watching their press, and as I stood there with Herbert Colby's grandchildren, on the final day, as the press was dragged down the street, none of us had any words. Did Herbert Colby start all this, or was it the circus printers before him, or was it Gutenberg, or does any of it matter anymore? Does it matter that a computer can spit out anonymous replicas of words it does not understand? Is it any different to wrap a building in vinyl emblazoned with slogans and pictures? Is that fundamentally different than putting a telephone pole poster up? The street corners will be adorned with other advertisements printed by other printers. Passing Angelinos will not recognize the difference. For me, the economy and simplicity of Colby was always a great thing. And I don't think Los Angeles street corners will ever look quite the same. Colby Poster Printing, Los Angeles, California. Family owned and run for three generations since 1948. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>